Hi, everybody. So, uh, Ricardo and I are friends from the Peter Drucker, and uh, I keep learning from him. I, um, I noticed in the mirror, uh, on a light note to start, and hopefully most of this is serious, but light, uh, that I had a butterfly. My wife gave me this tie last week, and she always picks out my ties. And I th thought about, my goodness, that's part of the image of this whole conference transformation. So if what you think I say today sucks, um, that's a Harvard term, uh, I hope you'll give me some style points. Uh, but before too quickly, I just noticed 20 years ago when I first, oh God, it was longer than that, it was the mid 80s, I moved to New York City. Anytime I would be asked to give a speech, I had this fancy Mark Cross leather binder that I would put my speech in. And I have before you here a folder with duct tape on the bottom so things don't fall out when it's in my backpack. So I guess our uh, things that matter to us about impressing others change as we go through life. Um, I've got some slides I want to share with you as I, as I go through this. Uh, I, I also, let me make a comment about, I was scanning earlier this morning when Jim McNerney was talking about the fabulous career, particularly the last part, Boeing. I was going through different people's kind of bios who were speaking here, and I went through and I said, eh, self-interest. I said, I wonder what they have about me. I wonder what my public relations guys put together. And I've got to admit to you, I, I'm impressed. Uh, I'm grateful for the good things that have happened. But there were admission, admissions in my bio. And these admissions, I've got to say, I've got to share with you. Because when I look back over my life, it was really, it's been my failures, my flops, my face plants that have really, really shaped me as a leader and made me stronger as I moved forward. And you know, the longer I was a CEO, the more I found out that's the truth for most of us, except we generally hide that stuff. And that's generally the stuff that really makes us. I, um, I say on that, as I get into this today, what I want to talk about, about transformation, I think the most important transformation people do is with themselves, from the person they are to the person they could become. And, you know, because we had the guy who's leading uh, TED Talks, recommend you go on. Carol Dweck wrote a great book, and it might be an 11-minute TED Talk, and it's on mindset. And it has to do a lot with transformation and this journey we go through in our life. I don't think there's a, a, a better time to talk about transformation because um, it's been two months since the business round table. We made a decision in the West to change this incredible primacy of shareholder value, which has been going on for years. By the way, I told the guys back there, I'll forget about my slides, so it's OK to come on and say, Rick, turn the slide, OK? To change from shareholder value to really stakeholder value. Uh, I've been arguing with public company boards I served on for years on this subject. And why I think it's so important is because 50 years ago, the average share of stock was held for eight years. Now it's held for six months. Even Jeff Vinnick, the guy who built Magellan, this morning announced he's given up. After eight months, his new fund, he said, you know, put some calls, I can't handle it any, uh, anymore. And Jeff's still a young guy. Stakeholder value. I must say, and I will take, uh, responsibility in parts for this. A number of us Fortune CEO executives in 2016, we preempted this business roundtable meeting, and we had a great host, Pope Francis, 
and I'm not even Catholic, I'm Buddhist. So we convened it in Rome, and we met for three days talking about the real responsibility of companies going forward. So what we decided is there's a new model that's coming forward, and the words you start to hear coming out of other places is this whole conscious capitalism. Now, within the concept of uh, transformation, I want to talk a little bit uh, about that. Gary Hamill, uh, who's a really bright guy, about 15 years ago, he wrote an article about transformation. And in it, he really talked about that there was one school of thought that basically said, who needs the dumb old incumbents when you have all these cool startups? Well, the truth be known, most of the jobs are with these boring incumbents. Apple has 120,000 jobs and is the most valuable company. The most valuable company 50 years ago had 800,000 jobs. Walmart has more than 2 million, but you can't support a family on what they pay with that. And it's interesting, more than 90% of the startups are really experiments, and most don't make it. Some do. Now, I don't want to get the point here that I'm not saying that they're not important, the new startups, but allowing big incumbents to become disposable, I think, is lacking in thinking about the collateral damage of what happens to not only stakeholders, but societies. Let me show you some pictures. This is what blight looks like. This is November 2018. I had a driver take us for an hour through sections of Detroit. I could not believe, I couldn't believe the beauty of the initial design of many of those homes and where they were. This is really heart-wrenching here. Before they left, they wrote, all I ever wanted was a white picket fence. This is America's Chernobyl. And it wasn't a question there in Detroit that Motor City and America fell out of love with each other. It's Detroit stopped making cars that America wanted. They fail to transform. Now, the list goes on. I can go through lots of other companies where, you know, one of the most recent, Kodak, 1913. I mean, that was the blue chip company thought of as I was growing up in the Midwest. They built an industrial campus. I mean, they even called it Kodak Heights. It was the star section of Syracuse. Actually, too, people have said, well, wait a minute, they got usurped by digital. They were co-creators of digital. And yet, they kept their focus on film. They failed to shift. This is what it looks like today inside. Oh, there's still now a you know, rebirth of a Kodak you know, with one you know, 20th of the employees they had back then, and there's really a niche player. How about this one? I grew up before, you know, you'd go to school in the fall, going through the Sears catalog. My mom gave me a budget. We figured this out. Sears, you want to talk about, they shifted, but they did the wrong shift. Remember when they shifted to the softer side of Sears? Cheryl Teagues, ask a millennial today, who Cheryl Teagues is. For a company like that to go bankrupt when you owned Craftsman, when you owned Kenmore, I mean, I can keep, when you owned Die Hard, now it's easy now, Monday morning, to look back and say, well, why the hell didn't they buy Home Depot or start their own? They had entrenched powerful positions. So you've got to not only transform and shift, but in the right direction. And so what I want to do 
it would be helpful if I looked at my notes from time to time. Uh, but what, it, what this really gets onto, I have two points I want to share with you and put for it. Just two. This is the first one. Every successful business model works until it doesn't. <laughs> now, I think it's interesting. This is toward the end of the day, and you have a CEO, and you had the beginning with the CEO. Boeing was the headline. Jim did a great job. Boeing was the headline on the Wall Street Journal today. Did you see it? Earnings down 50%. When I turned over the helm at Tupperware, we were $70 a share. We were 16 yesterday. What am I saying there? Transformation is not a one and done thing. The naval warship I served on before, I was a navigator, before you walked out on the bridge, there was a Bakelite plate sign and it said, eternal vigilance, the price of liberty. But it's the same with regard to transformation as well. It's never, ever done. And the second point that I want to share with you is all any organization is at its core, and simply, it's a collection of people. Quickly, my transformation or odyssey. Went to school, was in the Navy. Navy was the most important time in my life because, and people who see the car I drive every day, it says big bumper sticker says Navy, because it's the first time I was ever given a leadership position as a platoon leader. And I found out, hmm, there are a lot of things I wasn't good at, but this was growing at me, and I loved it because I loved the stewardship of helping and working together with other people and investing in them. So I get out of school in the Navy and I start a company. Oh, did I think I was a star in my 20s. Uh, it was called Dynamics. I got news commentator Paul Harvey to be, gave him 10% of the company. And we were gonna become the company that got people out of burning homes alive. We created a device that really, most people die in fires, die between 10 at night and six in the morning. And I went out there, built it across the country, recruited firemen, college students. They wore a badge that said Fire Safety Crusade. It was wonderful. And then the federal government mandated detectors in the home, and Sears started selling what we were selling for one-fifth the price. I didn't see that coming. Uh, and boy, it was difficult. But ever you know, tenacious, I started a new company. Was always interested in staying fit, trying to stay young as long as you could. Created Fortunate Life Centers. Opened it after months of research in a December. Wonderful headquarters. Clients rushed in late December, January, February. Actually, I decided, wait, why go slow? Franchise this thing. Within six months, 200 we opened. And that's when I found out about a year later, weight loss is a first quarter business. <laughs> the typical use of a product like a Nordic track kind of product by April of each year, it's to hang clothes on in the spare bedroom. We closed 80% of those life centers. Oh, it was shameful. Uh, I left town, most people didn't know it, but I knew it, kind of like a failure. I was living in Charlottesville, Virginia, had the dean of the law school and business school on my board. And people then said, well, what'd you do then? I joined Avon. I came to New York City, 9 West 57th Street, two blocks away from here. And people asked me, well, why'd you join Avon? And I said, let's see. I remember, I needed a job. <laughs> uh, now, they wanted me 
because I had started two companies, I was a general manager, an entrepreneur, and they were so functionally focused. People spent their whole careers in these very narrow channels, and they didn't generally see the whole thing. It was a, an incredible time for me and for Avon. Every time I'm up here and see that red nine, I remember how important that also was to my life. Firstly, I had a senior strategy position in the beginning, learning their business. And then within a year, they made me an officer, moved me to Europe. Although I'm an Austrian heritage, I could only say Guten Tag back then. Their biggest business over there was Germany, and what a wonderful time it was for me. Within a year, we went from double digit down to double digit up, and it was an important time living and working in Munich. More than 100,000 women in that organization. And then they moved me to Hong Kong. They were running it out of 9 West 57th Street, and they said, let's run Asia Pacific out of Asia. And so I built the management team, and we went over there, and I became a group president. It was just wonderful. Lobbied for China, for favored nation status, for WTO membership. Those relationships have stayed today with senior officials in China. And then I was pulled back to New York, and that was also a wonderful time. In 92, I was recruited to Tupperware. And boy, have you ever made a decision in your life that you didn't look really deep enough, and then you look back when you got more information, and then you said to yourself, what the hell was I thinking? Uh, week one had to do a $100 million write-off. Uh, I found out the headquarters building was for sale. The last thing that the guy who designed the Kennedy Center, Edward Durrell, Durrell Stone, made the Country Music Association wanted to make it a old folks home. This is the guy that did the Kennedy Center. So I had to make some serious decisions. Started off by looking at what have I got to work with here? What's our sources of competitive advantage? Became real clear to me, the first one, women. We had 600,000 incredible women in many different countries. Two, we had a brand name that people loved. They were out of touch with it, but they really loved it. Third, we had a selling system that, in fact, we could demonstrate high-tech products in it. So I said, well, how do we build off this? So we really started to get to work with that. I went out there, and all over the world, we started opening countries. We started teaching personal development at those, and the whole concept that each of us are two people, the person we are today, the person we could become. And I will tell you, when we did the Global Fairness Initiative, did studies of Mexico in our business, and Indonesia, they found out startling results. After three years, she went from thinking I'm not good enough to I am good enough, and a third thinking, Gosh, I'm a leader. Two, from lower class to middle class. Third, she became connected to other women. And fourth, in a, in a world where one out of three women is abused, he went from disrespect to mostly working for her. She started running things. That was our great power. We started to go, it was contact, competition, recognition. We moved away from food storage to high-tech products where today you could grill a steak in a microwave on one of our devices that converts microwave energy into thermal energy. It was a fabulous, fabulous time, those 25 years of running that company. And I was pleased and proud of all the accolades that Richard commented on. I've got to say, though, at the very core of it, it was this. It was people. That's why I just loved this. I didn't see it before. What you guys, Rick, Ricardo, what you guys have put together here, you get it. At the core of any organization, 
it's people. All any organization is a collection of people. And I would say this is where many are starting to understand that times have changed. Used to be autocratic work. This is like the video you just saw. Uh, okay. Then it went to rules-based. Now it's human. This is the top behavior that I see leaders want today of their people. Notice none of this is what you would have called in former times at business school hard stuff. It's soft stuff that's really the hard stuff. We started deciding in any company I served on the board of, there is one major objective in a company to create an operating landscape where people can become the best versions of themselves. Interesting, this is what you want. Empowerment, engagement, excitement. You want to unleash this in an, in an organization. Interesting, I'm going to share you four ideas here. Rosabeth, Rosabeth Moss Cantor, years ago she was head of HBR, and I read an article in the 80s, and it's interesting, two or three years ago I saw her at Davos, and I said, Rosabeth, I really want to comment that that was career changing for me, and she said, did I write that? I said, I'm going to quit giving you credit for it, but I still do. And she talked about the kind of operating environments that you need to create. And she said, number one, they had to be fast. And let me tell you what I found at Tupperware. We were bleeding when I first went there. And I said, I need this and this and this. We need this information. And then people would come to me and they said, well, wait a minute. You want it fast or do you want it right? I said, let's see. I want it fast and right. And that became a slogan for my 25 years all over the headquarters, fast and right. Marines used to say, once you had 85% of the information, lock and load. Lock and load and go forward. Fast, focused. Uh, I had a guy who worked for me. God, he was so smart. But there's scarce resources. And I used to say, Mike, have you noticed that for 20 years you've always worked for me and I've changed his name to protect him and I've never worked for you? And I said, Mike, do you know why that is? And he said, no, why? And I said, because you're smarter than I am. He said, what? And I said, Mike, we'd go into a country in crisis and you'd see 10 things. I generally would only see three. But they generally were often the three that mattered. Scarce resources, focus required. Flexible. God, that's what we've always talked about. You've got to sit there and design it, and it won't be perfect. You've got to launch it. You've got to refine it. And then you relaunch it uh, out there. Flexibility. And I've got to tell you, one of the most important is this one, fun. Fun is what causes people to become renewed. And it leads me to another thing. There's a, um, a guy by the name of Tony Swartz. You don't know Tony, but Tony used to write for the New York Times. And Tony really wrote a book called Art of the Deal that Trump put his name on. It was Tony's book. And then after that, he created a thing called the Energy Project. And I've worked with Tony some on this. And here's how he would talk about it. And that's why fun matters on this. He said, we have different zones. Notice some are negative, positive, and then uh, up and down, high and low energy. There's what you want, performance zone. But you can't do that all the time because the energy, we are not, as the video said, we are not machines. So you need a re renewal zone. Because if you don't go to the renewal zone, you go up into the Pacific Northwest quarter of this, which is called survival. And then if you keep running on high energy, negativity, you face burnout uh, in an organization. That's where this operating landscape really comes together. So that's why I look at CEOs really what they ought to be. Chief culture officers working with another group of people, all of these people, it's a we. 
so that what you get is units of leadership. When Eisenhower would talk about who won the Second World War, you know what he used to talk about? The corporals and sergeants. It was the units of leadership. And he said, my job is to make sure we have a direction, a strategy, and make sure they have the resources. So it is about people, and I think the Brightline people have got this right. We've worked also at, uh, at, at this whole Peter Drucker, the, who really was the dean of the idea of management, but I think the real guru on the subject of humans and human potentiality is Charles Handy. And he wrote a beautiful thing that I'll close with. He said, things and resources should be managed. People can only be encouraged, inspired, and led. And he said, you and I are not human resources. Thank you for your time. Thank you.